I love the music, right? Getting to walk up to that, that's pretty special. It kind of gives you the, you know, good feeling. So today we're going to talk about a bit about the history of web frameworks and then the microservices explosion. And I'll talk about UI development in the microservices world that we live in now. And then I have some information from developers that have been implementing micro front ends. And then I will do as the title promises, tell you how to win at UI development in a world of microservices. But first, my name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana. No electricity, no running water. Had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day, but in the winter we got to ski, so that was nice. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife Trish and two awesome kids, Abby and Jack. I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him off eBay in 2004 and restored him over 12 years. He's a very expensive obsession. If you have a similar obsession with Volkswagens, I'd love to talk to you after. One of the mistakes I made was I put a Porsche engine in him and a Porsche transmission, but it's fun now. It just took a while to make it happen. I work for a company called Okta. We do users as a software service. The acronym for that is UAS, so not a very good one. Uh, you could say users or authentication as a software service, but that's ass, so not much better. So now a little bit more about you. I assume that a fair amount of you are web developers. If you are, please raise your hand. Okay, so we've got about 75% of the room. Anyone developing with Angular? Okay, that's about half the room. React? That's a good third of the room. And then Vue? And there's five people. I mean, Vue gets a lot more press than you think it would. But again, we're at a Java conference, so it's not quite as popular here. Anyone doing microservices at their companies? OK, I'm going to say that's about a third of the room. Anyone doing micro front ends? OK, there's about a handful. OK, all right. So. I'd like to talk about web frameworks in general. I myself am an aficionado of web frameworks. I got into Struts 1.0 the month it was released. So personally for me, that was good timing. I was working on a software project just south of Denver where I live, and I was asked to create a web framework that we could use on the project. And I was like, I just learned what servlets and JSPs are. You want me to create a web framework? So when I found Struts, I was pretty happy about it. And through that time, I've kept up with web frameworks pretty well. In fact, the first talk I ever did at a conference was on comparing web frameworks. And it was a Java conference. It was Apache Con. And I talked about you know Struts and Tapestry at the time and later Spring MVC. And the funny thing is I was able to do that talk for 10 years. Because in Java, we didn't have a whole lot of innovation. And in fact, I gave it here once, I think, back in 2013. So in the Java space, we basically had server-rendered frameworks, right? Where you would render the JSP or whatnot on the server side. And we also had an explosion of web frameworks in 2003 and 2004 to the sense where a lot of other communities made fun of us because we had so many Java web frameworks. Well, then in the mid-2000s, along came Ajax and single-page applications and the mobile revolution with iPhones in 2007. And then the web gave way to Ionic and React Native because a lot of web developers wanted to develop mobile apps, but they didn't want to learn something like Objective-C or even Swift or, you know, a new programming language. And then it came to static site generation. That's been really popular in the last couple of years. Performance optimization on the front end has always been popular. And today what we see is a mix and match of server rendered because some companies need you know, really fast uh, product pages and things like that, single page applications and static websites. Blog posts now for the most part, blogs, are done with static or compile time rendering, right? Gatsby is a very popular tool for that. Personally, on my blog, it's very similar. I'm still using Apache Roller, and we use Velocity to actually render everything, but it just renders once, and then it caches everything forever until you actually update that blog post. So it's been a very interesting time. GraphQL is also becoming more and more popular, but really it's been a lot about JavaScript just becoming you know, a renaissance in the single page applications and making it so we can develop everything 
in one bundle and ship it on a phone or ship it in a browser or whatnot. So around 2014, shortly after the single page applications became popular, we ended up with the microservices explosion. And some people call this SOA reincarnated. But it was actually invented way before that. In 2005, Dr. Peter Rogers and Juval Lowry called it, services are composed like Unix-like pipelines and the web meets Unix and we call it true loose coupling. And James Lewis, Martin Fowler, Adrian Cockroft, and Joe Walms were some of the pioneers that they give credit to of the current microservices era. And I often say if it's a blog post on Martin Fowler's blog, then that's what really kicked things off, and that happened March 25th, 2014. Well, I don't know if you remember what else was invented in 2014. That was Spring Boot 1.0. Of course, it was invented before that, but that's when it was released. And so March 25th, 2014, April 1st, the next week, Spring Boot 1.0 comes out. And then Spring Cloud 1.0, was released the next year. So in the Java space, we basically got access to very good tools for doing microservices. And people have different notions of good, but I would say that very easy tools, in the sense of you could write 10 lines of code in one app, 10 lines of code in another app, and be able to have a microservices architecture. So microservices are often based around Conway's law. And that says any organization that designs a system, system defined broadly, will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So I was fortunate enough in 2007 and 2008 to work at a company called LinkedIn. And at the time, I was brought in as a consultant because I knew a lot about web frameworks. And a lot of their developers really didn't like the web framework that they were using, largely because they had their own JSP compiler. And the developers basically were like, I know JSPs, and that doesn't seem to be a very good technology in the sense of the broader community kind of looks down upon it. But also because I'm learning this JSPs that's not going to be used outside of LinkedIn. And so what they wanted to do is adopt a open source framework like Spring MVC. So they hired me, and I came in, and you know we talked about options. and. They definitely had a scaling problem in the sense of they needed a web framework that didn't really use any memory and didn't have any session state or anything like that. So a lot of the component-based frameworks weren't an option. But the reason that I'd like to tell this story is not about Spring MVC or Tapestry or anything like that. It's about a different problem that they had. They had two very successful apps. They had one that was written in Ruby on Rails, and it was actually a Facebook app. And I believe all it did was has, it was called like bumper sticker or something like that. And it allows you to like, you know, send a image to someone else that was like a bumper sticker. And they had, you know, thousands of them you could choose from. And then the other one was a recruiting app. And that was LinkedIn Recruiter. And that was written in Groovy on Grails, right? Or Grails as we know it now. And the CTO came to me and he was like, we need to pick one of those. Can you spend two weeks? like seeing which framework is better, and then we'll consolidate and only use one because they seem very similar. And so what I discovered after that two weeks was sure it was possible to make that Rails app implemented in Grails or implement the Grails one in Rails, but after talking to the two teams that worked on them, what I really discovered was that if they made either of the teams switch frameworks, they were going to lose that team because the team was so passionate about Ruby on Rails or Grails that they were like, that's what I want to do. And it was still pre-IPO, so maybe they wouldn't have quit, but they were certainly passionate about their frameworks. And so my recommendation at the end of that was use both, right? Allow both, allow these teams to do whatever you want. And fast forward, you know, 10 years later, LinkedIn is one of the biggest microservices architectures out there, and they have things written in Play, Scala, Spring MVC, Node.js, all these different frameworks. And so I think that's one of the powers that microservices really gives you, is it allows your developers to develop in whatever they want, as long as it's got a URI that you can reach, and it can be aggregated at some sort of API gateway. Right? That's the microservices reason for the microservices explosion. 
And so service boundaries are usually reinforced by team boundaries. So Conway's law really says that if you have an organization that has DBAs over here, middle tier developers here, and UI developers over here, like good luck with microservices. Because to develop microservices properly, what you need is really product teams. You need to have the ability of an autonomous team that can take something from an idea all the way to production and monitoring production and own and enhance that actual microservice. So monitoring becomes very important. And if you don't have that structure, then you're basically, you're going to be in a little bit of a bind. So what I've noticed is microservices on the back end allow different frameworks, different languages. But what about the front end? So my experience is that as long as you can aggregate everything in the back end with microservices behind an API gateway, they work great. And on the front end, though, it doesn't seem to be happening that much. What I see a lot of times is you know, there's actually the code for all those microservices still sits in like a single bundle on the front end, or maybe there's some lazy loading to facilitate speed, but it's still like a monolithic front end. And so that can become a problem. And this is a great website to learn more about micro front ends. So in my experience, I work on a project called JHipster. And I like to think that JHipster is kind of the state of the art in the Java world for doing Java and JavaScript front ends. And the reason I say that is because, one, we have a ton of committers on the project, and two, we have a lot of feedback from developers out there, and we're doing the things that a lot of the developers agree is a good idea. So I have a video I'd like to play that kind of explains how JHipster does it. And I'll just I'll briefly tell you that we generate microservices on the back end, and then we aggregate it on the front end. So this video will actually show you how that all works. Oh, see, I almost messed that up. I do that time to time. Got a mirror, and then switch it around. My name is Matt Rabel, and this is a quick overview of how the UI works in a microservices architecture when using JHipster. So I have this JDL file that defines a gateway, a blog, and a store application. I'm going to start by downloading that. Then I'll open up a terminal window, create a directory, and then create my applications using import JDL. So that created three applications. You can see there's a blog, a gateway, and a store. The gateway is where all the UI code is contained. The blog and the store are back-end microservices. So if we went into store, for instance, and look at its package.json, it just has generator jhipster. And that is so it can generate entities in the back-end using jhipster. So I'll go ahead and start all these. But before I do that, I'm going to go into gateway and start some essential services. Since we're using OAuth 2 for authentication, we need to start Keycloak. And then we'll also need to start the jhipster registry for service discovery. And then the store application has a MongoDB database, so we'll need to start that as well. Now we can start each individual application. So we'll start the store there. And we'll start the blog and the gateway. And while that's running, I'm going to open up the store just to show you the code. If you were to look at the source main directory, there is no web app directory, right? There is no web app in here if you go. Oh, we were so good on the Wi-Fi. So the store is just a microservice in the back end, and it really doesn't have a front end per se, right? The front end is talked to from the gateway. And uh, I'll just go ahead and stop this. Um, 
but it, it walks you through basically that the back end is just Java code and there really is no front end. And if you were to look at like the index.html file that's in there, all it says is, hey, this is a microservice, there is no front end. But if you look at the gateway, that's where all of the Angular code in this example, jhipster supports React and Vue as well, but Angular code on the front end. And so the gateway, what that actually becomes is a monolith. Because if you modified anything on the back end, even though you're using microservices from the Java perspective, you're going to have to maybe modify the front end. And if you modify anything in the front end, you're going to have to redeploy that whole thing. So until I actually encountered micro front ends, I always thought jhipster was the best way out there. I thought it was the way of doing things the easiest. But then what I realized was we're actually doing things maybe harder. But I think at the same time, we're lazy loading, which is the number one thing if you're doing a single page application. Because if you're doing a single page application, chances are you might be able to put it on a mobile phone. You can maybe make it into a progressive web application. But as a progressive web application, you need to make it fast, right? A mobile application should render in under three seconds, or people typically abandon it. But most mobile websites take 20 seconds to load, so it's a pretty terrible experience for a lot of users. So lazy loading is what it really gives you the power to pop that first page and then you know, subsequently load the other pages as you need them on demand. So it's great if you have one framework. In this case, right, we just have Angular and we don't really need you know, to have other teams you know, doing React or whatnot. But the problem that they had at LinkedIn eventually was that they had so many developers, you know, I think they're up to 1,000 or 2,000 developers now, at least when I worked there, it was about 500. They needed a way to get code to production, right, quickly. Not every week, they needed it every day. And so that's where microservices really come in because you can have an autonomous team that's developing a service, being able to allow them to put that into production as well as its UI independently is a, is a very powerful feature. So. With jhipster, in this case, it doesn't really give you that ability. It doesn't allow teams to really be autonomous. Sure, you could have a microservice team that just works on the back end be autonomous, but the front end is still you know, on that gateway, and people will have to modify that app separately. So what happened with micro front ends, and part of the reason that I got interested in it was, or I got interested in it, and then this happened. Uh, Martin Fowler another blog post. His last one was microservices, right, in 2014. So this one was micro front ends, and it happened in June of this year. It wasn't written by Martin, but it was written by Cam Jackson. And so part of the impetus for this was ThoughtWorks Radar. ThoughtWorks Radar is a bi-yearly publication that comes out and says, you know, you should stop using this, you should maybe adopt this, and you should take a look at this technology, right? And so in November 2016, micro front ends was assess. In November 2017, a year later, it was trial, like check it out. And then as of April of last year, it went to adopt. And then November 2019, it's still in adopt. And so what ThoughtWorks witnessed was that micro front ends really gave teams smaller, more cohesive, and maintainable code bases. They were more scalable organizations with decoupled autonomous teams. And basically, the ability to upgrade, update, or even rewrite parts of the front end in a more incremental fashion happened for a lot of these companies. And then to quote the most recent ThoughtWorks radar from November 2019, it says, we've seen significant benefits from in introducing microservices, which have allowed teams to scale the delivery of independent, deployed, and maintained services. Unfortunately, we've also seen many teams create a front-end monolith, kind of like jhipster, right? A large, entangled browser application that sits on top of the back-end services, largely neutralizing the benefits of microservices. We're confident this style will grow in popularity, when they say this style, they're meaning micro front ends, as larger organizations try to decompose UI development across teams. So the first mention that I could find of micro front ends was from Michael Gears. And that's when he started micro-frontends.org way back in March 2017, so almost three years ago now. 
And his first commit said, front-end integration recipes for composing a website with multiple teams. And I think that's very important because that was one of the benefits of microservices, right? It wasn't about scalability. LinkedIn had no problem scaling their monolith. It was really about scaling their teams. Once they had a certain number of developers, they really needed to split things apart, not only to support their passion for different frameworks, but also just to allow them to deploy to production. That's a very important part of microservices as well, is continuous integration and continuous delivery, right? You need to ensure that that decoupling exists between your services with the continuous integration, and then you need to automate your delivery because you might be deploying several times a day. So in this particular example, and this is from micro front ends, you'll see the page is split into separate components and fragments, which are owned by three different teams. There's team checkout, which is you know the blue bubble there and the, uh, the basket at the top, is now responsible for everything related to the purchasing process. And namely, you know, the buy button and the mini basket, and then the green manages the product recommendations on the page, and the page is owned by team product in red. So the cool thing about it is like the green team recommendations, that can kind of go away, and it's not really gonna destroy the app. And this is something I learned in like the mid-2015, 2016, and it's something that I really didn't have a lot of insight into, but you should design to fail. If you're gonna build resilient systems, you know, with microservices and micro front ends, you should be ready for part of that to fail. As developers, a lot of times we just, you know, test the happy path, but testing the failure path and allowing parts of your page to fail is a great thing. You might notice that Amazon, like, Amazon's never down, but there might be parts of the page that are down, right? And that's because they employ a similar micro front ends architecture. So the techniques seem to be many different things. Uh, web components is often the target output in the sense of whatever framework you're using, you develop web components of, so they can be consumed by any other framework or just by regular HTML. Use custom elements to create web components, DOM events to communicate between the different front ends because you might have a front end in React and you might have one in Angular and you still want them to be able to talk to each other. Server-side rendering is very popular in the sense of server-side includes or edge-side includes. And what that means is there's actually an endpoint similar to microservices, but for the front end that renders the HTML and the JavaScript that it needs and maybe even the CSS that it needs. And CDNs and cache busting are very popular deployment mechanisms. So Cam Jackson's article on micro front ends describes many different approaches. Build time integration, where you actually you know, combine things together at build time. Maybe there's some static compilation that goes on. And then runtime integration with iframes, which you know, iframes have their own issues, but it is an option. Runtime integration with JavaScript seems to be one of the most popular ways to do it. And then runtime integration with web components. And so, of course, there are frameworks for doing micro front ends. So Project Mosaic is a set of services, libraries, together with a specification that defines how its components interact with each other to support a uh, microservice style architecture for large scale websites. And Taylor is a part of that. Taylor is a layout service that uses streams to compose a web page from fragment services. And it says it's partially inspired by Facebook's big pipe. To me, this seems like Spring Cloud for the UI, right? There's all these different components that you can use. You don't have to use them, but you can. It's sponsored by Zolando, which is an e-commerce company. And it's got like a multi-service platform for fashion. So is anyone using Mosaic? That's a no, not anyone. And I talked to someone last night that was like, I tried it and wholly complicated. So, you know, it is an option, it is out there. Uh, single Spa is another one. What Single Spa allows you to do is as a JavaScript library, you can have many small applications coexisting in one single page application. So this is sponsored by Canopy Tax. Strange name for a web framework company, right? 
but Canopy automates busy work and connects your entire tax practice so you can focus on what's important. So I think it's interesting that the innovation in this space, or at least for these particular frameworks, is coming from a fashion company and a tax company, right? So at least they're real businesses, right? In the sense of they're probably making money and they just needed a solution to their problem, to scaling their developers and making things happen that way. Anyone using single spa? Okay. Um, I will click on this demo here just to show you what it looks like. Hopefully it's, it's up. Um, let's go back here. Then you're not seeing it. I do make that mistake. Oh, the internet's down. Again, let's give it just one try. And then Miriam. trying. It's a good test, right? If it actually loads on like a slow connection and it works, then we know that uh, you should use it, maybe. Okay, so you can see here, there's a number of different examples, you know, transitioning between React and app Angular applications, lazy loading the entire thing for fast initial load times, and parts of the page written in one framework while the other ones are another. So. Uh, this is actually the most common example that I see, or one of the biggest reasons that ThoughtWorks has actually had people adopt micro front ends. And that is that people adopted AngularJS in droves back in 2010, 2011, 2012. And you know how a lot of corporations work. Once they adopt something that's bleeding edge like this, they really don't want to change. So when Angular was like, hey, we're gonna go to Angular 2, and it's gonna be TypeScript, there was a ton of developers that were like, uh-uh, right? I don't wanna do that, and so AngularJS quickly became legacy. So there is a whole lot of applications out there that have a Angular code base, and they don't wanna rewrite it all, because it works, and there's really not a lot of ROI in rewriting something, but what they wanna give developers the ability to do is write new parts of that application in React. And so that's what I see as one of the big reasons for microservices and micro front end adoption is just because you know, these legacy code bases need to support another framework in there. So let me go back to seeing my notes here. So I asked my network, right? And this was last summer, July 30th, 2019. Have you implemented micro front ends as described on microfrontends.org and in Cam Jackson's article? If so, how have you done it? And you can see custom elements is popular. ESI plus H include, which I'll get to in a moment, wasn't used by anyone. Project Mosaic, you know, a little bit, and then single spot, 62%. So a lot of people using that. And you might look at this and be like, that's interesting, but what you might not notice is the number of votes that I got. 13, right? So I have a pretty big network, and usually when I put polls out there, I at least get you know a couple hundred responses. 13, that implies no one's really doing it. So they're still very bleeding edge, in my opinion. And what I see, both from the companies that have these frameworks, as well as the developer stories I'm about to tell you about is it's really companies that have a scaling problem. Scaling developers or scaling from legacy technology to newer technology, they're the ones that are adopting micro front ends. And generally, you know, a lot of developers out there, if we don't have to, we're not going to. And so one of the best stories I heard about was from IKEA. So this was a conversations about software engineering podcast. And if you get a chance to listen to it, it's great. And it'll be way better than this talk, I promise you. It's by Gustav Nilsson. I'm not gonna try to say his last name. I think he's Swedish, but it's K-O-T-T-E. Kote? Kote? Judging by the laughs, I'm maybe right? Maybe not. So what IKEA does is they have uh, awesome, huge website because they have so many products. So 
Static pages are a big part of their web app and website architecture. They you know, have new products and they just generate those pages and they're very fast and they're just you know, HTML, very little JavaScript and images in them. And then they use single page applications for specialized parts, maybe the shopping cart or maybe the administration of the website, but a lot of things happen at compile time. And they use edge site includes for their architecture and you know, specifically with the micro front ends part of it. So the edge site include is basically you know, at the CDN layer, they can just have like a comment in the code and that goes out to a URL and grabs the already pre-rendered you know, web component and pulls that into the page. And they're a very large company, right? They have over 200,000 employees. And so there's edge site includes, there's also CSS for individual components. So each component can have its own CSS that it pulls in as well. And they use H include for doing includes on the front end. And so this person, uh, Gustav, actually is the inventor of H include, and it's a client side include. You know, I think H stands for HTML. The cool thing is it only sucks in the actual HTML when it renders or when it's in the view. So if it's below the fold and the page hasn't actually loaded, it doesn't pull that in yet. So if you were to, to look up his Twitter handle, what you would find is that's his pinned tweet, is like the latest version of H include that was released. There's also a developer on the J Hipster team, Frederick, I'm not gonna try his last name either, H-A-H-N-E, he's a German guy, so not like you would say it in English, but he works at WeScale, and he's a J Hipster committer and a friend, and they had 40 developers, so quite a bit different than Ikea, which you know has thousands of developers. Um, and they started with four developers in 2014. So when I interviewed him last summer, you know, the company's been going on for five years and now they're up to 40 developers, which was kind of odd, but they use server-side includes and in HTTP streaming to do their you know, micro front ends. And they use Mosaic and Taylor and a UI gateway with reverse proxying and authentication. And he basically said that UI development is now fun again. It was painful at one point, but now they really enjoy it and it works pretty well. He's one of the only ones that I know that really likes the Taylor framework. But the other people have just said it's complicated, right? They didn't say like, you know, I could do something better. So um, he has expressed an interest in implementing it with Jay Hipster, but that's about as far as we've got. We haven't actually started the work on it there. What I learned from both of those real world stories is that a style guide is very important. In the sense of if you have your components that are being developed as web components, and maybe they have their own CSS, you're really gonna want a style guide that people can use to know how to style those and you know, maybe pull in some certain classes that are just rendered at the out layer. Maybe you have some global CSS that's used. I also heard from a company last summer that they were doing micro front ends with a lot of Kubernetes involved in the sense of all their backend infrastructure and even parts of their UI were running in different Kubernetes pods and then if they want to do local development on a UI, they could do that there and then proxy out to everything else. So from a development experience, it allowed them to just work on what they needed to and then pull all the other pieces in. And you can imagine if you actually had to run everything local, I mean, the J Hipster demo I showed earlier, that starts up like 14 containers just to run you know, a couple microservices and you know, a database and all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to do this, you don't really want to make everyone have to buy a kick-ass laptop, although it's a good idea if you can convince your company to do it, you should have the ability to you know, proxy out to existing running services and just do the UI development locally. So some other examples that I got from this Tom Soderlund article in July 2017 was Spotify, which is local here in Sweden, uh, Upwork, HelloFresh, Klarna, and one that I learned about from comments about this talk was uh, Dazone is a live streaming service, so apparently they're doing a lot of micro front ends as well. It's interesting though, because like Dazon and Spotify, they kind of seem like they really don't have a lot of UI available, right? There's not a whole thing like Amazon or like Ikea, it's not a shopping store, but um, still it's cool that they're doing micro front ends. But again, you know, a lot of us aren't. So my advice, is they both seem pretty nice to me. There's two ways to do it, right? There's one framework, components, and lazy loading, kind of like J Hipster does. So if you're gonna do a monolith UI, 
use lazy loading. What I've seen as well is companies like Comcast are doing microservices and micro front ends development, but they're actually developing and deploying separate React applications, and they're full page applications, but they're just separated by URL. So that to me is kind of like micro front ends, but micro front ends seems like where you have different portions of the page are actually the micro app, right? Rather than different URLs on a site or different micro front ends. Or use micro front ends that allow any framework leveraging web components. So there's more initial infrastructure, talking about the Kubernetes setup example, right? That's someone's got to manage that and make it so you can actually do that as a developer without setting up everything locally. And you can, they can be very useful if you need to just upgrade a portion of your stack. For instance, moving from AngularJS to Angular 9, which could be released any day now. All the blockers are closed. I've, I learned yesterday that Angular CLI has some blockers, so that's why Angular 9 isn't out. But what I really like is it can enable developer passion. Right? So there's very many developers that are passionate about their framework, about their language, and you could allow them to use whatever they like. If they really like React and they're you know, interested in Vue, then they can explore that. They don't have to use Angular if they don't want to. So as a person that makes decisions in your company, wouldn't you want to be an enabler of developer productivity, team independence, and passion? Like, I sure would. So you can learn more at microfrontends.org as well as the Martin Fowler article and the case podcast I mentioned is, uh, is at that URL there. And there's another one called Web Front Ends with Lucas Doman that I enjoyed. And ThoughtWorks has a podcast on what's so cool about micro front ends. So when I first wrote this presentation last summer, I decided to create a ticket for Jay Hipster and say, hey, we should try implementing a micro front ends prototype with jhipster, right? So I explained kind of the precedent of it, put a $500 bug bounty on it, and actually went ahead and created a ticket. And like I said, Frederick is very interested in Taylor, right? So he added some comments on how he thinks we should do it. And if you wanted to go to the ticket, you can see those comments. And then someone actually posted just a couple months ago a blueprint. And so jhipster has a concept of blueprints. What blueprints allow you to do is override the default behavior. So instead of actually you know, using Angular, you can, we have a view blueprint, so that'll override Angular and use view instead. And so I believe it's pronounced Entando, but it's an Italian company as far as I can tell. And if you go to this URL there, it shows you how you can use the Entando platform to build you know, micro front ends with jhipster. The only problem that I see with it is everything here is jhipster but they're calling it Entondo, but they have micro front ends. That's the only real difference between this blurb and like jhipster, right? It has all these things normally. And so I looked up the company, Entondo is a micro front end platform for Kubernetes. I did a little bit of research on it and it turns out, you know, they seem like a legit company. I think they have, you know, hundreds of developers working there and uh, they seem to be based out of Italy and San Diego and, you know, the CEO actually lives in Denver but he doesn't have his face on his LinkedIn profile. It's like CEO, right? Should have a face on there at least. But what I found in this tutorial, I started to do it, and it's a 30-minute tutorial. I'm the kind of developer that likes 10-minute tutorials. If I can figure out something in 10 minutes, then I'm gonna be like, sweet. And so part of the problem with it is it actually makes you set up Keycloak and like create realms and users and everything like that. And I'm a big fan of OAuth, right? Okta does OAuth too, so I have no problems with that. I just want you to automate it. So Jay Hipster uses Keycloak for OAuth and OIDC, but we import the Realm for you and everything works. So I don't know why in this particular example they made us like set up Keycloak, but I haven't gone through the whole tutorial, so I'll admit that. You know, I made it through eight minutes, and then I was like, we gotta automate this, right? Make it 10 minutes and it'll be cool. So right now if you want to use it, you actually have to go and clone a repo, and then npm install it, and then npm link it, and then you can generate your app and have you know, basically uh, UI components on your microservice. So it is independently developed, right? You can do that. But as far as like setting up Keycloak for the authentication and everything, I need to look into that a bit more. But I do think they've spent a fair amount of work on it. And like I said, it's just mostly the micro front ends part. So I need to look into that, especially because they're calling their whole company 
a micro front end platform for Kubernetes. So anyone basing like their company kind of on micro front ends and jhipster, like that's interesting, right? So has anyone heard of Entondo? That's a no, All right? On the live stream? No, just kidding. So I wrote a blog post about this exact talk, how to win at UI development in the world of microservices. So everything I've said today, if you'd rather read it, then you know, watch it on a video or whatnot. Um, it's available there, and there's many more links. So um, speaking of our blog, I do a lot of blogging. It's a cool job, right? Write blog posts, create example apps, only test in Chrome. It's really a nice place to be. So we write a lot on microservices with .NET, Node, PHP, and Java, as well as Angular, React, Vue, Electron, React Native, and Ionic. So we do have some time left here. Before we get to questions, if you need to contact me or have any questions, hit me up on my website, rabeldesigns.com. You can also hit me on Twitter at mrabel. My direct messages are wide open. I've already uploaded this presentation to Speaker Deck, so if you were to go to that URL, speakerdeck.com slash mrabel, it's there. And I put a lot of code on GitHub. So may the auth be with you, but we do have you know five or six minutes for questions, so please ask. And I'll repeat them if I see them. And if you don't, then you got five minutes of your day back, right? I know people are shy. If I wait long enough, there'll be a question. But otherwise, no. Thanks for coming.